recording. Okay, so we're getting this on record. Right, okay. Well, I, will, I will repeat that, yes, that this is Pam, and I, I affirm to you that what you, what's on the PowerPoint and what is in the dysrhythmia handout is what you need to know for the exam. Uh, no, we don't need to have it notarized. We're all, we're all set with that. Oh, you guys are bad. Now, you realize that this is, a, um, this is a, a video that I will be posting for posterity. Other classes will hear this. I don't, I don't re-record every semester. I'm only doing it this semester because we got the new text. Where is normal sinus? With, okay, there's normal sinus on the bottom. And now I am going to put PVCs on the top. And this is a unifocal PVC. PVC stands for premature ventricular contraction. So when we talked about PACs, earlier, premature atrial contractions where we had an ectopic focus in the atria that was causing that extra beat. Now we have an ectopic focus in the ventricles causing extra ventricular contraction. So it's a, a premature ventricular contraction. And there's a bunch of terminology that you'll hear when you're listening to them give you that telemetry report. Um, you have unifocal. Unifocal PVCs means that there is one area in the ventricles causing those ectopic beats. And the way you know that it's unifocal is that all of the PVCs look the same. They're the same shape. So here you have a normal PQRST, 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 and then you have a blah, 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 where you have your PVC, a premature ventricular contraction. And then you have a pause because everything's out of whack now. And now you're back to normal PQRST, PQRST, and now bada boom, you got another premature ventricular contraction. So unifocal, one area in the ventricles causing the ectopic beat. The, one, the vast majority of times when patients have PVCs, oftentimes it is caused by electrolyte imbalances, particularly low potassium. It's a, no, it's, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's not even, that's not the T wave. That's an abnormal QRS, ventricular contraction. And because it's, because, so because it's happening outside of the conduction pathway, it looks different from all your other QRS complexes. So it's a ventricular beat, but it's not like your other QRS complexes. And it's going to look different based on where in the ventricles that ectopic beat is, beat is being generated. So hypokalemia, electrolyte imbalances, um, other, um, you know, MIs, patients with MIs are at risk for developing PVCs. And in that patient that's had an MI, if they have more than five in one minute, you've got a problem. That's why when we talked about MIs, controlling and regulating and managing their electrolyte levels is extremely important. Because if that MI patient gets hypokalemic, and they have a run of PVCs, they can go into VTAC or VFib and they can die. They can go into cardiac arrest. So unifocal, consistent shapes, because it's one area of focus. Now, I'm going to put the uh, unifocal on the bottom, and I'm going to put a multifocal PVC on the top. Now, you're going to see, as you look at these PVCs, there's a PVC there and one there, and they look different. They look different because the ectopic beats are being generated in a different spot in the ventricles. So unifocal, one area of irritable focus, multifocal, many, more than one. And the, reason, and the way you can tell that is that your PVCs look different if they're coming from different areas of the ventricles. So and whereas the unifocal, you can see they look the same. And if I put the grid on, you can see on the bottom, all the PVCs look the same. On the top, they're looking different. Well, they're, they're, they're generating a beat. Remember, automaticity generates a beat. And it's only supposed to happen on the conduction pathway. If there's cells outside of that conduction pathway that are having that automaticity party, then they're going to generate a beat. And that when they generate an impulse, they're going to cause contraction. And if it's in the atria, it's going to cause a premature atrial contraction. If it's in the ventricles, a premature ventricular contraction. Now, other things that you're going to see with PVCs and when you're hearing the reports, you're going to hear um, about bigeminy. 
That means you have every other beat is a PVC. So up on the top we have bigeminy. We have a normal complex, PVC. Normal complex, PVC. If it's trigeminy, every third beat, and it's going to happen regularly, every third beat, if you're in trigeminy, is going to be a PVC. If you have couplets, that's two PVCs in a row. Triplets, three PVCs in a row. Now, are they unifocal or multifocal too? Uh, they can be unifocal or multifocal. In this case, it looks like they're unifocal, these, this couplet here. So many patients can have PVCs and be totally asymptomatic, like me. Uh, about two or three years ago, I was in my doctor's office for a routine checkup, and um, the tech was taking my radial pulse, and she looked at me and she goes, are you feeling okay? I go, yeah. She says, well, your heart rate's 48. I'm like, I don't really feel like it's 48. So the doctor comes in and said, we're going to do an EKG. So, and of course, the tech never took an apical pulse. They did the EKG and my heart rate was 85. So why do you think that was happening? Right, and can't palpate, if, you got, if you're having PVCs or some other, or other types of dysrhythmias, oftentimes your cardiac output drops and not all the beats are getting to the periphery. So that's why the apical rate is so important. So he comes in with the report and he says, well, you're having PVCs. Are you sure you're feeling okay? And I said, feeling fine, totally asymptomatic. Uh, he said, well, you're having, um, you're in uh, bigeminy and we're going to do a workup. So I did the, you know, the echocardiogram, and then I did the stress test. And um, very dangerous when you know what an EKG is supposed to look like, and they put you on a treadmill, and things are not looking the way they're supposed to. So I'm on the treadmill for maybe about a minute, and I see the monitor, and I am throwing, uh, I'm in trigeminy, I'm in bigeminy, I'm in couplets, I'm in triplets, I'm all over the place. I'm having runs. And so I, I very you know, calmly stepped off the treadmill and said, I'm not doing this anymore. <laughs> because at that point, when I was teaching about dysrhythmias, I was telling you guys that anybody who has more than five PVCs in a minute is going to die, <laughs> you know. But when I sat down with the cardiologist, he said, no, 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 no. If you have an underlying structural problem or a coronary artery problem, then if you have more than five PVCs in a minute, you're, you're at risk. But he said, if your structure is normal, which the echo said it was normal, if you, the, uh, they ended up doing cardiolite and, um, and doing my stress test that way, so your coronary arteries are fine, um, you have probably been having PVCs for years and never even knew it. And, um, and so you'll just kind of continue along um, until you become symptomatic and there's a problem. So no medication, just check in with the cardiologist every year to make sure things aren't getting any worse. But that's what can happen. Many elderly patients will, and I'm not saying I'm elderly, but many elderly patients can throw PVCs occasionally, and that's why nobody gets all upset when you hear in, in telemetry report that they're getting occasional PVCs. Because if everything else is looking good and they've got no structural or CAD issues, then usually there's nothing they can do um, and to treat that and, and change it. Um, I just, you know, I was on a diuretic, so I started eating a banana every day. Um, you know, but my potassium, everything was fine. All my electrolytes were fine. There was no reason why I should be throwing the PVCs, but I was. Um, so if the patient is symptomatic or if they are an MI patient that you need to get those PVCs under control, then you're going to treat them. And the drug of choice is going to be lidocaine because lidocaine decreases ventricular irritability. So hypokalemia increases ventricular irritability, can cause PVCs. So correct those electrolyte imbalances. And if that doesn't work, then you're probably going to be giving lidocaine. That decreases that ventricular irritability. Uh, let me see. Uh, if I have, uh, let me see, I have couplets and I have what is called a salvo, which is like a burst of PVCs at the top there, uh, versus, um, say, a couplet. But basically what you're going to see, if you see a triplet, you're just going to see three of these in a row instead of just two. Yes? So you still have the phrase. I still have it. 
I mean, for the week, for the two weeks that I was getting all this worked up, I must have wore a hole in my wrist checking my pulse about every two minutes. Um, and yeah, I mean, occasionally I may, like sometimes, you know, like when you lay down in bed, and you can hear your heart beating, and I'll say, hmm, it's a little bit irregular. Nope, nothing, nothing. And I was surprised when I went in to see the cardiologist that I didn't get something. And he said, no, because you don't have any underlying structural or coronary artery issues, so we're just going to watch it. Yes, Patricia. Sometimes, you know, like you can hear the, the blood rushing in your ears sometimes. And, um, you know, and, and sometimes I can hear it and it's kind of irregular. No. No. It was a little freaky there until they told me that I was okay. You know, and I was, I was getting a little OCD about it all, but I'm fine. Yes, Joel. Right, if they've, if they've had an MI. So like uh, that patient, that post-MI, you're treating them in the ICU. They came in, they've had an MI. Um, and like I said last week, when, they, when you have an MI, you're at a very high risk for dysrhythmias. 70 to 90% of the patients with MIs will develop some sort of dysrhythmia. Um, you really have to watch them because if they do develop PVCs and they get runs more than five a minute, then they are at a very high risk of going into VTAC or VFib. So that means if they had an MI just prior to Right. If they have a history, it'll depend on how unstable they are. Um, you had a question? No. No. No, because they're going to, even though there is a family history uh, of cardiac issues on both sides, um, until I actually become symptomatic, yeah. because there really is no reason that they can look at that says why I have it. If I became symptomatic, probably put me on cardarone. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, because it just depends on what's happening with that heart and how it's beating and what's happening to the blood flow during those, and, and you can have some, some abnormal heart signs, sounds, which would not necessarily, like a murmur, you usually think of valvular issues. Um, but sometimes it can just be because of the irregularity of the heart, heartbeat, you can, you can sometimes hear what you think is a murmur. But it's just that abnormal, that irregular beat. So we clear now on PVCs. Okay. Um, so now we're gonna go into uh, VTAC and then how that differs from VFib. So I'm going to put normal sinus on the bottom and I'm going to put VTAC on the top. So VTAC happens when you have a run of PVCs and the heart starts beating very, very rapidly. Uh, so irritability post MI is a very common cause for VTAC and you need to get that corrected right away or that patient um, can ha go into cardiac arrest. Um, so it's a heart rate that's greater than 100. And because you're still having ventricular contraction, you're going to see a sawtoothed QRS. And it's so rapid that you're not seeing the, the P or the T. It's kind of everything is kind of, you know, overshadowed by that very rapid QRS complex. But just like with atrial flutter, where you had atrial contraction and a sawtoothed P wave, with VTAC, you're having a sawtoothed QRS complex. So there is some, there is ventricular contraction, but if we have a very rapid rate, we're shortening diastole, we're lowering the filling, uh, filling amount into the, into the um, chambers, and we're decreasing cardiac output. So patients cannot tolerate this type of dysrhythmia for a very long time because their cardiac output is, sincere, is, is sincerely, you know, significantly diminished. So there's two types of VTAC. There's pulse and there's pulseless. If they have a pulse, then we're going to give them oxygen. We're going to give them lidocaine. We're going to find out what the underlying problem is and try to correct that. If they are pulseless, so if you see on the monitor that they're in VTAC but you can't get a pulse, you treat that just as if they're in cardiac arrest. You're going to defib and start CPR. So if they've got a pulse and you see that VTAC on the monitor, then you're going to treat them with oxygen and lidocaine and watch them very closely because they can, they can tank very quickly. 
But if there's no pulse and you see the VTAC, just treat them as if they're um, in, in uh, V-fib or they're in cardiac arrest. And you defib and you do CPR. Now that's VTAC. I'm going to put VTAC on the bottom. And I'm going to put V-fib on the top. See the difference? Okay. What we've got with fibrillation, what do we say fibrillation is? Quivering. So if the ventricles are quivering, there's no contraction, so there's no cardiac output. So this, when you see this, you're not going to have a pulse, you're not going to have respirations, you're going to be doing, you're going to defib and do CPR. So everybody see what the difference is? Sawtooth, we've got some ventricular contraction, so we've got some cardiac output, but we've got to do something about it because that patient's not going to last very long at that rate. V-fib, we've got to do something immediately because we're quivering, we have no cardiac output. So everybody cool on ventricular dysrhythmias? Okay, so now we're going to do heart block. So I'm going to put sinus rhythm on the bottom and I'm going to put first degree heart block on the top. Okay, so any time that you have a disruption of con conduction between the atria and the ventricles, you're having a heart block. Sometimes what will happen is that that impulse will invert back to the atria, so you'll have an inverted P wave. Or sometimes you'll have an extreme slowing of that impulse through the AV node, because it's supposed to slow somewhat, but in some types of blocks, it'll just slow too much. That'll be a prolonged PR. So first degree AV block, um, many patients are in AV first degree block, oftentimes they don't even have any symptoms. They may or may not be bradycardic. Now in this uh, first degree AV block, they have a regular rhythm and they have a, a rate of 60 to 100. So they're not even bradycardic. So many patients in a first degree AV block, we don't really have to do any kind of treatment unless it's because of a, a, um, like a ditch toxicity or something like that. So that's first degree AV block, too much of a slowing down between the atria and the ventricles. And sometimes that can be because of ischemia um, or trauma. But frequently it's because of ditch toxicity, beta blockers, those kinds of things. So I'm going to put first degree block on the bottom and I'm going to put Second degree type 1, okay, come on now. Uh, second degree type 1, and let me see, first degree is on the bottom. Okay. <clears throat> so we have second degree heart block, and there's two types of second degree heart block. Type 1 is also called Mobitz 1, or it's called Winky Back. Winky Back. Obviously, after the doctor who discovered and identified it, probably. Um, patients with a second degree AV block will have, um, will have a, um, a gradual increase in that P to R interval. And eventually, what will happen is they will just drop an entire QRS complex. So with a second degree AV block, you see the P to R interval right there. And then on the next beat, it's a little bit longer. And on the next beat, it's even longer. Again, this is all slowing down through the uh, AV node. Now it's even longer. And now all of a sudden, we've got our P wave, and we've dropped our QRS complex. So there's a pause. And then we go back into what it was way back here. So now it's, now it's normal for that patient. And now it's getting a little bit longer. and a little bit longer there, and longer there, and then we have a P wave and a dropped QRS. Many patients are asymptomatic with this as well. May have some signs of decreased cardiac output. Um, rarely will they need a pacemaker. Occasionally they may need atropine if they become bradycardic and they're symptomatic. Because what does atropine do? Increases your heart rate. So that is type 1, second degree, type 1, Mobitz 1, Wanky Back. 
So I'm going to put Wanky back on the bottom. And I'm going to put second degree type 2, Mobitz 2, no Winky back. Just, they couldn't come up with a different name for type 2. So we have second degree type 2 or, or Mobitz 2 is what they call it. Now what happens with this type is that you have just a random dropping of that QRS complex. So all of your complexes are going to look fine. Your P to R intervals are going to be fine. So you've got a P, Q, R, S, T, 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 P, and then no Q, R, S. And this happens randomly. From the Wenke box, from the type 1, is that you have an increasingly elongated P to R complex. P to R interval, I mean. So here it's short, it's a little bit longer, a little bit longer, longer still, and then they drop the QRS. So there's a gradual lengthening on the winky back of that P to R interval until the QRS is dropped. With the second degree, the type 2, it stays the same. The P to R interval stays the same, but all of a sudden, but a boom you've lost a QRS complex. And that's a random thing. Many of these patients are going to be symptomatic and will need a pacemaker for type 2, for, for second degree type 2 Mobitz 2 versus second degree type 1 Mobitz 1 Winky Back. Because, they, they, because they, they do become, because of the randomness of the dropping of the, of the QRS, it's hard for them to compensate. I think what happens with, with uh, type 1 uh, here is that their the body is adjusting to that longer, slower P to R interval. So when the QRS is dropped and then they kick right back into, uh, you know, a decent uh, complex, then um, it doesn't seem to be as, as um, you know, as stressful to their heart where they would need. But occasionally they will need a pacemaker for, for either type. Yes? Um, a lot of people will, will say, will, will usually refer to it as winky back, just because it's, it's, it's kind of specific. What's that? Did I hear somebody say something? No. Yeah, it's easy to remember winky back, and then just remember then, then the other one is type 2. But a lot will depend on, you know, who you're talking to in that particular time. Okay, and then we have third degree, which is a complete heart block. So I'm going to keep second degree block one on the uh, bottom and I'm going to put third degree on the top. What's happening with a complete heart block is that the impulses between the atria and the ventricle are completely blocked. There's no communication. So you got the atria contracting at their rate and you got the ventricles contracting at their rate. But what do the ventricles have to rely on for contraction? the Purkinje fibers. And what did we say the intrinsic rate was for the Purkinje fibers? 20 to 40. So this patient needs a, needs a pacemaker right now. And they're going to need a temporary pacemaker while they're waiting for the surgery to put in the, uh, the permanent pacemaker. Because you can't keep going with you know, a 20 to 40 beat ventricular rate uh, for very long. This patient is definitely going to be symptomatic. They may lose consciousness. They may have a syncopal episode. Um, a lot of, a lot of uh, issues that need to be addressed immediately. So that's third degree. And you can see there you've got the P wave, you've got a QRS, you've got a T, you've got a P wave, and then a long pause, and then a QRS kind of randomly there and a T, and now a P, and then a long pause, and a Q. I mean, it's just all over the place. There's no rhyme or reason. There's no synchronization between what's happening in the atria and what's happening in the ventricles. Complete heart block. Now, I've got the, uh, there's part of the handout that talks about asystole and PEA. Asystole, you're all familiar with, flat line. Um, pulseless electrical activity, it means that there is some electrical activity going on in the heart, but it's not, they, they don't have a pulse. It's not generating really any contractions. Um, so it almost kind of looks, if you're looking at that, almost kind of looks like what we saw with, uh, with V-fib. It's, it's, there's just, you know, random waves that you're seeing, but no real uh, conduction and cardiac output. 
I've included on here some information about bundle branch blocks that I'm not going to test you on, but everybody would ask me because you'd hear about you hear that in telemetry reports all the time. They got bundle branch. So I just put that in there so that um, you've got that information, but I won't be asking you any questions on uh, a bundle branch block. So that is it for the dysrhythmias. I've got to pause these. Uh, so hypokalemia, we talked about, we kind of already talked about that a little bit. Um, increases um, ventricular irritability, uh, can cause PVCs. And um, at worst, uh, VTAC or VFib. So what, what drugs specifically are we going to be worrying about? Our diuretics, our loop diuretics, our thiazide diuretics. Um, and increased stitch toxicity is going to be an issue if they become hypokalemic. Remember, we talked about that whole interaction with hypokalemia, DIG, and Lasix. Hyperkalemia, what's going to happen? What are we going to see with hyperkalemia? What is it, how does it affect the EKG? What's that? Peaked T waves. So usually a slower heart rate, um, irregular heart rate. Um, later on in hyperkalemia, they can also go into VFib or VTAC. How about if we have hypocalcemia? What's going to happen to our heart rate and our contractility? It's going to decrease it. So think hypocalcemia. Think what calcium channel blockers do. So we have low calcium. We're going to have a slower heart rate. Um, hypercalcemia, what's going to happen? An increased heart rate, bounding pulses. But at some point, the heart's going to give out, and they're going to become bradycardic and go into cardiac arrest. What can low magnesium do? Beg your pardon? Torsades, so that's an, an irregular heart rate, torsades to point. Um, tall T waves, ectopic beats, uh, risk for VTAC or VFib. Um, patients that have um, hyperglycemia can become hypomagnesemic, that's a hard one to say. Um, so oftentimes correcting their hyperglycemia can help to uh, get, you, get your magnesium into balance. So now some of the treatments, cardioversion, we kind of alluded to that uh, when we talked about some of the dysrhythmias. Yes? I can't tell you that. I'd have to look that up. <laughs> but it's not something that you need to know. So, so cardioversion is a synchronized electrical countershock. And why does it have to be synchronized? When we're doing cardioversion, we've got a dysrhythmia, we've got a tacky dysrhythmia, we want to shock them back into normal sinus. Why does it need to be synchronized? Right, and what is the wrong point? Where do we not want to deliver a shock? During the T wave, because what's happening during the T? Diastole relaxation. So when you've got a patient that's got a heartbeat, and you need to do cardioversion, you need to do this, what's called a synchronized shock, which will not deliver a shock on the T wave. It will only do it during the PQRST. So usually for tachy dysrhythmias, you'll see cardioversion with a fib, a flutter, um, and, all, and that's what that's going to do is shock them back into a normal rhythm after all of those other treatments have not been successful in converting them back. Yes? Oftentimes people with AFib that, that are symptomatic, that they can't convert them out of AFib, and they don't respond to all the other treatments that you're giving them, like the usually DIG or beta blockers, then, uh, or Cardizem, calcium channel blockers, then the next step is usually cardioversion. And prior to doing the cardioversion, we need to do the TEE to make sure there's no clots in the atria before we convert them back to normal sinus. If there's, a, if there's clots, then they have to wait to do the cardioversion. Uh, defibrillation, on the other hand, is when you have um, pulseless VTAC, or VFib, it's an asynchronous countershock because you don't really, you don't have a, any complexes, any wave complexes. Another method that we can use 
Uh, I don't, I'm trying to see if I... Do I talk about ablation? Did I put that on here? No, I don't. Okay, ablation. Oh, no, that's later on under on the, uh, the EP studies. Okay. I knew I talked about it at some point. So, cardioversion defibrillation, synchronized countershock, asynchronous countershock. Implant and cardioverter defibrillator. Patients who have continuous issues going in and out of VTAC can have a, an implanted defibrillator that will fire when their heart goes into VTAC or VFib to shock them back into normal sinus rhythm. Oops, wrong one there. So that is a picture of, a, of a, an implanted cardiac defibrillator. Looks very similar to a pacemaker. Uh, cardiac pacemakers. That's when we have those Brady dysrhythmias that are not responding to therapy. The patient is symptomatic. They have poor cardiac output, um, and they need to be um, uh, need to have a pacemaker um, in, uh, implanted. And what the pacemaker does is it stimulates a ventricular rate, ventricular contraction, when that heart rate goes below a set rate that the, that the doctor has determined is the minimum amount of beats per minute that he wants or she wants that patient to have. So we have uh, demand, synchronous pacing or asynchronous. So can, who can describe what the difference is? What is demand versus asynchronous? So demand is only going to fire and stimulate a ventricular contraction when your heart rate drops below that set rate. Asynchronous pacing is going to be a fixed set rate. It's constantly going to fire, say, 65 beats per minute or whatever the doctor has, um, has prescribed for that. Non-invasive temporary pacing, that would be that patient in third degree complete heart block, and we're waiting to put in the permanent pacemaker, so they will have a, uh, electrodes placed on their chest in order to stimulate that heartbeat and keep them at a good um, heart rate so that they don't uh, die of uh, you know, cardiac failure. After the, pace, after the pacemaker is inserted and, and you're um, looking at that patient, you're going to be looking for what are called pacemaker spikes on the EKG, and that's the, that straight line up there. That's indicating that the pacemaker is firing. That's why when you listen to that telemetry report and they say the patient is 100% paced, 50% paced, when they're on that, uh, when they're on a, on a uh, demand pacemaker, that tells you that, um, you know, 50% of the time, the pacemaker has to fire to uh, stimulate a heartbeat to keep them up above their prescribed heart rate. And that's where you're going to see that on the EKG strip, is the spike. So you're going to be assessing for that. That's going to tell you how often the pacemaker is firing. Um, you're assessing for possible complications. What do you think complications might be when you have an implanted pacemaker? Ba battery, weakened battery. <laughs> well, actually, we don't have to worry about microwaves anymore. Microwaves don't affect the pacemakers. What's that? Cell phones, yes. Cell phones, they should not be carrying. If they have a pacemaker, they should not be carrying the cell phone in that left, si left pocket. Uh, but they do need to avoid magnets and things like that. Uh, but microwaves... Uh, the newer microwaves do not need, what's that? And, I'm sorry, what? Oh, right, right, yeah, they can't, they can't have an MRI. <laughs> yeah, some of, yeah. Uh, so complications, infection, bleeding. Um, they can have dislocation of the lead, so it stops stimulating or it can stimulate it too much and cause VTAC. And again, so the teaching that they have to have the battery checked periodically, they need to avoid strong magnetic fields, uh, don't carry your cell phone on that side. And then patients with, oh, here's a Here's a picture of a, um, 
pacemaker, and it looks very similar to that uh, ICD that we looked at. And some patients will have a combination of pacemaker and ICD. They've really got some conduction issues. Um, electrophysiologic studies, cardiac conduction surgery. So ablation is one of those procedures that's called, it's considered an EP study. And what they do is they locate where that irritable focus is, what's causing the atrial flutter or the atrial fib or the PVCs, and they zap those cells and kill them so that they don't generate any extra beats. And some patients who have, um, you know, severe atrial fib can't be treated with any other procedures and, and, uh, and non-invasive procedures will have what's called a maze procedure where they can act, they will actually do open heart surgery to do ablation on that, um, on the heart. So that's what you need to know about dysrhythmia. Is everybody feeling pretty good? Pretty calm, pretty relaxed? Okay, let's do the math. Your patient needs a dose of DIG, 0 0.25 milligrams IV push now for uncontrolled atrial fib. You have DIG 0 0.5 milligrams in 2 mLs. How much will you draw to get the ordered dosage? That's one of those you can almost do the math in your head. What'd you get? 1 mL. Okay, this is the, now we got the clickers. Nose, the nurse is scheduled to administer a dose of digoxin to the client with atrial fib. The client has a potassium level of 4.6. The nurse interprets the dose should be admit, omitted for that day. The client needs a dose of potassium before receiving the dig. The dose should be withheld and the physician notified. The dose should be administered as ordered. It's going to give me the error message. Ah, uh, yep. It always does that. Let's pause the recording. Okay. Okay, 5% said omit the dose. 24% said hold the dose and call the doctor. 71% says we should administer it as ordered. Why did the majority of you pick number four? What's that? What's the, the potassium is within normal range. So this is the thing that you need to always remember on NCLEX questions. You need to know your normals. Because if you don't know that's, at, that's normal, then you could pick a different uh, response. The nurse has received change of shift report on all these patients on the telemetry unit. Which patient should you see first? The patient with AFib, 88, new Coumadin order. Patient with type 1, second degree AV block, rate of 60, who's dizzy when ambulating, that's winky back. Patient in sinus rhythm, rate 98, after having electrical cardioversion two hours ago. The patient whose ICD fired three times today, who is scheduled for a dose of Cardarone. That's a typo on that, I gotta fix. Okay, 9% said uh, the patient with AFib, 41% said the AV block dizzy with ambulating, 23% said the sinus rhythm with uh, rate 98, and 27% said the cardioversion, um, who, I mean the uh, ICD firing three times today. So the patient with AFib, rate 88 with a new Coumadin order, is that a high priority? No, no because he's, in, he's within normal range, 60 to 100. 
Um, you're going to do some teaching. Coumadin is usually given later on in the day anyway. So even if this was the afternoon shift that was coming in, you still got till usually 5 or 6 o'clock to worry about the Coumadin. Uh, type 1, second degree AV block, rate 60, dizzy when ambulating. Not really an unstable patient because you've got the 60, and you can delegate to the uh, tech or the CNA uh, for the safety issues, right? So not your priority in the sense of the cardiac status. Uh, patient in sinus rhythm rate 98 within normal limits, right? Had cardioversion two hours ago. Yeah, you're going to be concerned about them, but are they still your highest priority? Now, the ICD that fired three times today, this patient means that they're continually going into VTAC or VFib three times already. So you've got some problems. You've got, you know, probably this dose of amiodarone is going to have to be changed. They may have to go to the ICU. They may, you know, they may have a lot of other issues and, and other meds that, that have to be given um, because he shouldn't be firing three times in one day. That's a very unstable uh, dysrhythmia. Patient has a cardiac pattern of undulations of varying contours and amplitude. No measurable ECG pattern is unconscious with no pulse or respirations. After calling for assistance, the nurse should start basic CPR, administer epinephrine, prepare for intubation, wait for the defibrillator to arrive. Oh, thank God, 100% of you picked start CPR. I'm so pleased. I am so pleased. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> okay, which action will the nurse take to improve the quality of the electrocardiographic rhythm transmission to the monitoring system? Apply lotion to the client's chest before attaching the chest leads. Remove the hair from the chest area before attaching the leads. Instruct the client not to wear any clothing made from synthetic fibers during the test. Apply skin protectant to the area prior to placing the electrode. So 85% want to remove the hair from the chest area. 10% said synthetic fabrics. 5% said skin protectant. Nobody wanted to put lotion. So what are the problems with one and four? It's going to keep the leads from not making a good contact. You've got to have a good contact to be able to get an adequate reading. Uh, synthetic fabrics aren't really going to affect your tracing. But uh, hair, again, you need to get a good contact. And if you've got a particularly hairy chest, you need to, you wax it, okay. And we won't go down that one, okay. Okay, what does a P wave on an EKG tracing represent? Depolarization of the atria, depolarization of the ventricles, repolarization of the atria, repolarization of the ventricles. Whoops, oh, I didn't, you didn't have to do that. 80% said depolarization of the atria, 15% said repolarization of the atria, and 5% said repolarization of the ventricles. What does the P wave indicate? Atrial contraction, right? So it's depolarization because relaxation, repolarization. That's how you remember what the difference is. Uh, so the ventricles have nothing to do with the P wave. The client's heart rate increases slightly during inspiration, decreases slightly during expiration. What action will the nurse take? Notify the doctor, assess for chest pain, document the finding as the only action, prepare to administer antidysrhythmic drugs. Fifty percent said assess for chest pain. Forty-five percent um, document the finding is the only action. What is this describing? Sinus arrhythmia, a benign arrhythmia that just when the patient takes a breath, it gets faster. When they exhale, it gets slower. The patient's asymptomatic. They're not going to get chest pain with this. 
So document the finding is the only action. You don't have to call the doctor. You don't have to give any dysrhythmics. The EKG reveals tachycardia with a heart rate of 170 beats per minute that was initiated after a premature atrial contraction. This rhythm resolves spontaneously without treatment. What is the nurse's interpretation of this finding? PSVT, ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation, rapid atrial fibrillation. Okay, 68% said PSVT, 18% said VTAC, 14% said rapid atrial fib. So um, because we have, because the heart rate is, has been, uh, has occurred after we've had a premature atrial contraction, what can we eliminate? VTAC and VFib, right? Anything ventricular, because it's an atrial dysrhythmia. So now we have rapid atrial fib. Is the ra does AFib happen when you've had a PAC? No, but SVT will, or PSVT, paroxysmal. So number one is the correct. Right, right. And usually atrial fib, oftentimes rapid, especially a rapid atrial fib, um, they have to get some sort of treatment to get that uh, resolved. Uh, the patient has a heart rate of 56, has no adverse symptoms associated with the bradycardia, not being treated for it. Which of the following activity modifications should you suggest to avoid further slowing of the heart rate? Make sure your bath water is warm. Avoid bearing down or straining while having a BM. Avoid strenuous exercise such as running during late afternoon. Limit your intake of caffeinated drinks to no more than two cups per day. So 89% said avoid the Valsalva maneuver, right? 5% exercise and caffeine. So what do you have, so will exercise, what will that do to your heart rate? Speed it up as well as caffeine. So avoiding those, those maneuvers that can lower the, the, um, the heart rate. 